Right, so thank you very much for inviting me to present today. So to illustrate just how neglected leishmaniasis is, quick question, who before today had heard about leishmania? Well, so we have some other neglected disease specialists in the audience, so that <laughs> games the system a little bit. But otherwise, still quite a few, which is good, <laughs> surprising actually. But I think one thing that I hope will come out of today's meeting at least is that you will all leave with an awareness of this disease. It won't be this mystery word that you don't even know how to pronounce. You'll know that there's actually quite a lot of people infected. And this is truly a global problem. In tropical and subtropical regions of the world, which is actually quite a broad distribution if you look at the bright colors on the map. This is a parasite, it's vector-borne, caused by sandfly bites, and it causes a range of disease manifestations, starting from cutaneous leishmaniasis, with lesions being restricted to the site of the bite, and then progression all the way to the parasite disseminating to the liver, to the spleen, to the bone marrow, and this is the fatal form of disease. But even with the cutaneous disease, there's very important social stigma associated with it. Those lesions can be quite large, they can be very disfiguring. So it's important to be able to focus on this, even though it's not the lethal form of disease as well. And it's strongly associated with poverty. It's found in some of the poorest countries in the world. And then within those countries, oftentimes the people infected are the poorest in that country. And most of leishmaniasis patients are living on less than a dollar a day. Now, in connection with that, there's been very little interest from drug companies in general. And since 1975, there's actually been only one new drug registered for use against leishmaniasis. And this is miltefacine, which was originally developed as a cancer therapy and then repurposed for leishmaniasis. And in East Africa, the st standard of care still is antimonial derivatives, extremely toxic, very high side effects, and they've been in use for almost 100 years. There's been some recent progress, especially with new formulations of amphotericin B, which allow for shorter treatment. But this doesn't always work against all species and strains of leishmania, doesn't always work in all affected regions, and it's expensive, which is a big problem when you're dealing with NTDs. So there's a clear need for new drugs for leishmaniasis. And this is where us and groups like us come in. So I'm part of the Center for Discovery and Innovation in Parasitic Diseases at UC San Diego, the center that Jayer presented this morning. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what we're doing there on Leishmania to try to bridge this gap and fill the patient needs. So to explain a little bit our screening platform, just a little bit of the biology of the parasite, it's a pretty straightforward life cycle with two stages. In the insect, you have the promastigote stage. And then in mammals, you have the amastigote stage, which lives inside your blood cells. So it's actually quite easy to grow the insect stage in culture, but we're trying to develop drugs to treat people, not to kill the parasite in the sandflies, which means that we need to focus on the intracellular stage of the parasite, which makes it harder to do drug screens, but it means that what we find is going to be more relevant and more readily applicable to patients. So I grow parasites and macrophages in culture, infect the macrophages, <laughs> Then we treat them with compound libraries. Um, we've been working in particular with um, FDA approved libraries, <coughs> but also some natural products, synthetic molecules, basically any compound library we can get our hands on. We then stain the parasites and the host cell with a DNA stain called DAPI. And then we have an automated fluorescent microscope which allows us to image the infected cells and then automatically identify parasite and hosts. So up here in yellow would be your host cells, and then the small blue dots would be the parasites. And this allows us to quantify parasite levels and the specificity. And people today have highlighted several times how expensive it is to take a drug to the clinic and how long it takes. Now here we have a situation where there's almost no acceptable treatment and very few financial resources. So we want tools to get drugs out as quickly as possible. And one way to do this is to work off drugs that have already been approved for other indications, so drug repurposing. So to do so, I screened a library of 1,600 FDA-approved drugs on this system I just introduced. And we found 21 preliminary hits, including an anti-helminthic and an antifungal. So these showed quite good activity in our screening against the parasites in vitro. And so the next step would be to confirm activity in animals. But once you've tested those 1,600 drugs, plus however many come out every year, 
that's it. You don't have anything else. So to fill the pipeline, one other approach we've been using is target repurposing. So this is not as straightforward as just taking a pre-approved drug, but at least we can build on existing knowledge on specific targets and use that as a starting point to develop new treatments. Now, ergosterol biosynthesis inhibitors have gained a lot of interest in the antifungal world. And one reason we think we can repurpose this target for leishmaniasis is the fact that leishmania, like fungi, have ergosterol in their cell membranes, whereas we have cholesterol. So we can exploit this difference to develop drugs that are specific for leishmania. So um, the azole family of inhibitors are important antifungals, and they inhibit this enzyme in the serial biosynthesis pathway called CYP51. So the first thing I did to show whether CYP51 is a good drug target or not is to try to knock it out in Leishmania Donovan. And we found that this, this was not possible. This enzyme is essential for the parasite. So this is important. It means that it's likely to be a good drug target for visceral leishmaniasis. And then to try and see how well we could repurpose existing inhibitors of CYP51, we tested a panel of uh, antifungals, as well as different ones that have been developed in our team to target the related parasite Trypanzoma cruzi. And so we did see some activity on Leishmania parasites, and this was dependent on CYP51 expression levels. But if you look at the IC50 values, they're considerably worse than what you saw for T. cruzi. So although this is a good drug target, clearly we can't just take those inhibitors that were designed for T. cruzi and transfer them to Leishmania. So this suggests that we are going to have to develop Leishmania-adapted versions of these inhibitors. But again, this might not be enough to fill the pipeline. So the third option, much slower, is to identify new drug targets. And this is something we may have to resort to. So one way I've been doing this is to probe the parasite biology, see what genes are important for disease development. Now, if you remember, there's different forms of Leishmaniasis disease, so it's also important to know if what we develop is going to be applicable to all the forms of Leishmania or just a specific one. And so I've been using several large-scale omics approaches, and one way I did is to do proteomics to compare parasites from cutaneous Leishmaniasis patients and visceral ones. And this allowed us to identify pathways that are important for one or the other form of disease. So, for example, I found that transport pathways are particularly important in cutaneous leishmaniasis. And in contrast, protection against host defenses, especially against oxidative stress and against fever, are especially important in visceral disease. So these are differences that we can exploit to develop disease-specific treatments. Or we can look at the commonalities to develop treatments <coughs> that are common that would be suitable for all forms of leishmaniasis. So once we've got all of these inhibitors working in vitro, the next step is to take them into our animal models. And we have a mouse model for both visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis. So for visceral leishmaniasis, mice are infected intravenously to get the parasite into the visceral organs. And then we count the parasites found in the liver and the spleen. So this is an illustration of what you would see with the current gold standard drug, amphotericin B where you cannot detect parasites in slides from the liver, whereas in your vehicle you see large amounts of parasites. But you're counting slides. This is slow. This is laborious. Not really high throughput in any way. So what we've been doing for our cutaneous leishmaniasis to facilitate this process is to use a bioluminescent model of disease. So um, my collaborators at McGill University have provided us with a cutaneous strain of Leishmania that expresses firefly luciferase. So when you add the appropriate reagent, there's light being produced. And this can be measured non-invasively, so that reduces our animal usage, first of all. It means you can accumulate data over time. You can see here the progression of the infection from week one, where you see very little luminescence, all the way to week six, where you see large amounts of light being produced in proportion to the increase in parasite levels. Now week six is where we come in and treat the mice. And again, with amphotericin B, you have very nice reduction in luminescence, indicating parasite clearance compared to the control. But I think something else you should be noticing on this slide is look at the mice themselves. Look how much smaller and scruffier the amphotericin B mice look compared to the vehicle. I think this illustrates quite how terrible amphotericin B is as a drug and how bad the side effects are. The mice, this is not a good treatment, so we clearly need new options. 
And this is hopefully where I come in and where you come in. So our group has been trying to fill the need for treatments for leishmaniasis using a variety of complementary approaches. We've been using drug repurposing, and this would be the fastest route to the clinic. But we've also been doing target repurposing and discovery of new drug targets. But clearly, there's much work still being needed. Um, the leader of our group, Dr. McCarrow, I would like to thank him for the chance to work on this. Um, this is a hugely collaborative effort, I think, as all good and modern science should be. And so there's people at UCSD that are heavily involved in this work. We have collaborators worldwide at McGill University in Sri Lanka and across the United States, as well as industry collaborators and support from American government, European Union, and the Canadian government. Thank you.